In a very small town, not too far off from the city, lived a woman named Melinda. Melinda was not well off and often found herself living paycheck to paycheck. She had a tiny house that wasn't like the fancy ones you saw on TV. It was just a really, really small house that somehow still managed to max her credit card each month. Melinda's father passed away a couple of years ago, and so her mother, Claire, moved in with her. She loved her mother dearly, but due to a recent back injury, Claire was unable to work, which only placed more pressure on Melinda to ensure her mother was well taken care of. It would seem that Melinda's life couldn't get much worse with an ill parent at home and barely any money to support them. Unfortunately though, Melinda has just finished her last 10 hour shift at the town's local gift shop. The gift shop used to be a great attraction for tourists, but with the city nearby, business had been slow, forcing Melinda's boss to close down the shop and leaving Melinda without the one job she'd held for the last 10 years of her life. Walking back from her final day at work, Melinda was feeling quite distraught and frustrated. She was a hard worker, but often felt like her efforts brought her nowhere. She already felt inferior to her friends who could afford to go to college and who now worked somewhere within the city's tall buildings that always seemed out of reach. Losing her job today filled Melinda with embarrassment. Her unemployment made her seem like the laughing stock of her successful group of friends. All Melinda wanted to do was talk to her father. She knew he would say exactly the right thing to comfort her. Filled with a sense of loneliness, Melinda continued her regular walk home with her head held down. Before making a turn into her driveway, Melinda stumbled upon a patch of forget-me-nots growing on the very edge of her lawn. This was an unusual occurrence because firstly, forget-me-nots are not supposed to survive in her town, and secondly, they were her father's absolute favorite flower. Looking at the small crisp blue petals, Melinda recalled a message her father used to tell her. Life can be really tough sometimes, but look around you, you have an army behind you. Me, your mother, and most importantly, God. Melinda smiled to herself at the memory. With the stress of the world around her, it was really easy to forget her spiritual life. But with this beautiful reminder that God would always be there for her, Melinda ran up the front steps of her house and into her room. She opened the Bible that was tucked away in her drawer and read the first verse her eyes landed on. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Melinda's face lightened with understanding and appreciation, and despite her daily struggles, she felt something that she didn't think she had felt in a long time. She suddenly, finally, felt at peace. So the story we just heard talks about a lot of really important concepts, and we're just going to look at those in a little more detail. In the story, we see that the main character, Melinda, goes from one difficulty to another. And something that would come to mind naturally is the question of why. If God loved his children, wouldn't he bless their lives? It's a very reasonable question to ask. And a very eye-opening thing to do when we have this question is look at the life of the one person God loved the most, his one only son, Jesus. And when we look at Jesus' life, we see a life that's not exempt from all suffering and pain, but a life that's almost defined by it. God humbled himself and came down to the earth that he made to live a life that would make any human being miserable if we were in his place. Philip Plancy, an incredible author, says that as humans, we're prone to two very fatal mistakes. The first one comes when we credit all suffering to God and we think of suffering as God's punishment to us. And the second mistake that we make is thinking that life with God includes no suffering at all because the life of God himself had suffering. God had the honesty and the courage to take his own medicine in the sense that he went through the whole human experience from troubles of family life to restrictions of hard work, lack of money to betrayal and humiliation. He went through it all and the crazy part about this is that he did it voluntarily. The all-powerful, in-control God chose to go through a life of suffering to show us what suffering can do and to show us that he can transform the bad into good and pain into purpose and to show us that he does understand how we feel and can be trusted to help to carry our pain with us. One of my favorite authors, Max Licato, um, worded it a little bit differently and said, instead of saying that God will transform the pain into purpose, he said, God will take your mess and turn it into a message for believers. He also said that we tend to think that if we pray to God, he'll just take us around our difficulties. Um, 
But if we look at almost every single example in the Bible, God takes his people through the difficult situations, not around them. He took his people through the Red Sea, through the lion's den, through the valley of the shadow of death as he promises, and through deep waters. We can't avoid the bad. The difference in the lives of believers and non-believers isn't in the amount of suffering that they have to face or that they have to experience. The difference is in the response. Philip Clancy goes as far as to even say that God allows for bad things to happen to believers to show the world the difference in the response. With God, we're given the ability to go through trials and tribulations with our inner peace intact. I honestly think that peace is a very underrated concept um, because God says that He can give us peace that transcends all understanding, but we don't really understand the actual value of it until we're there in the storm and we have to choose between staying calm and going insane. A sense of peace is such an incredible, priceless thing and it's key to survival. And the story, um, it's really cool in this sense because we hear that at the end, the main character's situation doesn't actually change, but she now has the peace to get her through her troubles, and she sees that as more than enough. A really cool analogy that explains the trials and tribulations in the story can be found in nature, in the rain. So the rain that floods whole cities and ruins homes and ends lives is the same rain that helps trees grow and gives us flowers and fruit and food to sustain life. And the same pain in our bodies, um, the same pain system in our bodies that force us to feel the pain that we do is necessary for small things like making sure we know when to take our hands off the soap so our skin doesn't get burnt or knowing when to stop walking when we twist our ankles so we don't break our bones. Um, the importance of feeling pain was talked about by Philip Nancy in his book, Where is God When It Hurts? And it's incredible, I highly recommend. But um, yeah, he just says that countless doctors and medical engineers have actually tried to improve the human pain system, but it's the one thing they can't touch. It's so flawless in its design that every so-called improvement actually proved to be really harmful to the person because decreasing the amount of pain that we have to feel just makes it easier for us to get hurt. Pain catches our attention, and we wouldn't pay attention to um, what our bodies lack or what our bodies needed unless pain was involved. In the same way, we wouldn't pay attention to what our spirits lacked or the comfort that our souls needed unless pain was involved. All the pain and hardship we go through turn our eyes to a source of comfort, and they turn our eyes to God. The story made a really cool point because when trying to comfort Melinda, um, it said, you have me, your mother, and most importantly, God. I love how they added the words most importantly before mentioning God. Um, it's really easy to forget God in the chaos of life sometimes, but that's exactly when we need his strength the most. Because God has capabilities beyond anyone and anything we look to in our lives for comfort. And yeah, we do look to other sources of comfort, whether it's social media or Netflix or food or whatever it may be. But what we're doing when we look to these things for comfort instead of God um, is trying to distract ourselves. And we try to avoid and go around our difficult situations instead of going through them. And to stay consistent with the analogy used, we're avoiding getting hit by the rain when we really need the rain to grow and produce fruit. So a really important question to ask ourselves would be like, what do we find our comfort in? Because what you find your comfort in is the same thing that you idolize and you worship. And we need to remember to look for God for comfort. And we need to remember that He is present in the pain and He does endure it with us. And He will give us the peace necessary to get through it and to grow. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. In the context of this verse from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verse 33, the Lord Jesus Christ was concluding his farewell discourse to his disciples, and this happened on Thursday, the night that he was arrested before his crucifixion, after the Last Supper. The Lord Jesus Christ did not promise his disciples a life on earth without tribulation. And this is for all of us the believers. But he assured the victory in him. And let us understand a few words here in this verse. The first word is tribulation. What does it mean? The word tribulation in Greek is thalipsis, and it means pressure. In Latin, it's derived from the word tribulum. 
and triplum is that tool or machine with teeth like spikes that tears and it's used for threshing the corn or the green. Triplum goes over the green and it separates the wheat from the chaff. So as believers, tribulation is very important to us. Why? Because it separates us, the wheat, from the world, the chaff. The second word is the world. And the world in Greek is cosmos. But it has four different meanings in the Bible. The first meaning of the word world is universe or the earth. Second meaning is worldly affairs, and this is the riches or the pleasures of the life. And the third meaning is the inhabitants of the world. This is humankind or human race or people. And the fourth meaning is adornment. And this is an English word, cosmetic, which is derived from cosmos in Greek, which means treating or adorning the face. So here in this verse, in the world you will have tribulation. I have overcome the world. Those two worlds are different in meanings. The first world, in the world you will have tribulation, means humankind or human race or people. In another way, in humankind, in human race, among people, you will have tribulation. And this is the same world that was used in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. For God loved the humankind. And the second world, which is I have overcome the world, means worldly or earthly affairs. And this is what was used in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Here the word does not mean humankind, but it means the worldly, earthly affairs. So in the world you will have tribulation. This world is humankind or human race. I have overcome the world. This world means the earthly affairs or worldly affairs. In the world, you will have tribulation. In the world, we should expect tribulation. Tribulation means pressure, sufferings, pain. But this is one face of the coin. The other face of the coin is victory. God knows and feels our pain and suffering. For the only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, he went through all these pain and sufferings, from feelings of anguish, feeling of loneliness, desperation, and sadness. Yet, despite any and all tribulations, He commands us to have peace. How we will have peace in tribulation, pain, and suffering in Him. And also He commands us to be of good cheer, or in other translation, take courage as He promised us victory. No doubt, every day in our life we may face challenges. Whether the challenge is through a test of faith by God, or the challenge is through an attack from the devil, it has a different outcome. That outcome will depend on our decisions. So here is the equation. Challenge plus decision equal outcome. Challenge might not be of our control, out of your hand, but the decision is yours and mine. The decision can be faith in God, trusting Him, patience, or any other virtue. The decision can also be pity, worry, anxiety, anger, or any other vice, but the outcome will be depending on this decision. So in other way, although the challenge is out of your hand, your decision 
will determine the outcome. And we always say this to youth, especially those who do not find the courage to say no to evil company or inappropriate places or bad habits. We urge them, take courage, be of good cheer. Why? Because you are able to conquer. You are able to overcome the world in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ lived as a man of afflictions throughout his life for our sake. And if he overcame the world in him only, we too can overcome the world and become victorious. A quote from St. Pacom the Great. Accept all trials with joy, knowing the glory that follows it, as if you realized that you'll never get tired from bearing it. Moreover, you'll pray to God not to take it away. Our Lord, the cause of joy for our hearts. You promised we would see you after a short period, and this short period is our earthly life. Thus, through this period, there will be a little sadness. However, you, Lord, promise to turn our sadness into joy, forever an unchangeable joy. This is the promise that we live by, and it is the one that makes it easy during our time in this world. How I wish to place this promise before my eyes every day so that any sadness would melt away and that your words continue to ring in the depths of my heart to remind me of your promise of joy. How I wish to alleviate myself above all fake joys, asking for the one which can never be taken away. How I wish to be the cause of joy for everyone around me and resist any sadness or heartache. 